Uh, Conor McKeown of the Herald joins us on the line now. Good morning to you, Conor. Morning, lads. We may as well start with that one. Uh, Kilkenny against Galway yesterday, 18 points apiece. They go to Thurless next Sunday at 3 o'clock, which is a fairly controversial decision, but it should be a good event in itself. Uh, the more you watch this Kilkenny team and the more you watch Brian Cody and this kind of cohort of youngsters he's got in the squad, the more you start to feel that he's getting closer and closer to finding his best team. And I think there was evidence of that uh, in quite a number of sections in yesterday's match. Yeah, absolutely. I thought in a lot of the cases, some of quite, uh, some of the younger players on the Kilkenny team were some of the best. Um, some of them were the ones who performed um, better than anybody else. Like, he didn't make the final three last night on the on the Sunday game, man of the match, but I had James Maher down as my man of the match just for what he did in midfield in an area where, um, you know, you'd have expected Galway to get more out of David Bourke, but um, I thought Maher was really, really good. He added a great bit of energy to the midfield for Kilkenny. Um, like it, it was funny the way the game panned out yesterday because we've spent so much time over the last couple of years talking about systems in hurling, you know, with teams playing with extra men back and sweepers. But like we we actually had an old fashioned de facto fifteen on fifteen game here. Like there's nobody left spare men for short puckouts, and both goalkeepers went long on both puckouts. But you know, strangely, like by half time, the game had never really caught fire, and we didn't really have much more than a whiff of a goal chance. Um, and I think in a lot of cases, the defenders were the, 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 like a lot of the ball that was coming in was long. Like Owen Murphy had to had the win in the first half and his puckouts were going 85 metres. But the ball was coming in and dropping high. Um, and, it, you know, it's it's just manna from heaven for defenders. So, like, I think the, the ball that was going in yesterday to both sets of forwards line was probably more sympathetic to defenders. And maybe that's why we didn't really get the sort of game uh, I suppose the two teams Billing should have demanded because um, like there's some serious forwards that, was on, that were on show yesterday that never really got going. But did it surprise you then, Connor, that the you know the management teams didn't change it up? You know, considering the day, considering the you know the the conditions, and as you say, considering the forwards that were on show. Yeah, well, I think they're both just sort of tactically inclined to play that way. Um, like they, 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 there's obviously a lot of hard work that goes on from half forward lines. But you know, I looked down when the ball was up inside the Kilkenny 45, and really it was only the two midfielders in either team that were dropping into their own defence, which doesn't really you know usually you, you would have two or three half forwards even. Um, you know, all the Galway forwards score from play, but none of them really caught floor. Like Niall Burke had an excellent game in the corner, but he kinda he kinda pinched four points, you know. I'm not sure it was he he had one of those days where he probably got about five possessions and got four points off it. Um but again it comes down to you know, there's no substitute in Harlem for having a, str a strong full back and a strong centre back and both number three and both number six for both teams yesterday were really, really strong. As ever, Dahi Burke was immense at full back for, uh, for Galway. Uh, Gerald McInerney, he probably didn't have his finest game, but he was under a lot of pressure because Owen Murphy just rained every single puck out down on top of him and TJ Reid. Uh, and I thought he coped really well in the circumstances. And then on the other team, I thought Porrick Walsh and uh, Killian Buckley were ex exceptional. Like they cleared an awful lot of ball. They won an awful lot of ball over their men. But, you know, I have to say as well, Joey Holden, um, who played wing back yesterday, who a couple of years ago had a had a rough year in a full back. I thought he was really, really good, and Paddy Deegan had some great moments as well. So it was a weird game. Um, you know, Galway were sloppy, and they probably made the more mistakes. And they were the team that you would look at and say they are the one that didn't perform as close to their potential um, as Kilkenny did, uh, and they probably have a fair distance to improve before they go to Torles next Sunday. Yeah, there was obviously those quotes uh, from Burke leading up to the, to the match during the week last week about uh, Kilkenny fearing Galway and all that sort of stuff. But do you think, maybe I'm reading too much into it yesterday in terms of the way Galway underperformed, as you mentioned there. Is there still an element of seeing Brian Cody on, on the sideline and looking at uh, the black and amber and thinking to themselves, crap, this is Kilkenny once again? And there is still that mental element from a Galway perspective. Well, I think if any team are going to put the fear of God into you, it's going to be Kilkenny. Like it's, it's a little bit like, you know, they reckon the reason the Yankees won so many games is because of the pinstripes. Mm. I wonder, wondered for 10 years whether those black and amber stripes had the same <laughs> effect on a lot of hurling teams because that's... But, like, Galway traditionally wouldn't have suffered from that affliction. Like, if you go back through Brian Cody's reign, like, some of the biggest defeats that he had when Kilkenny were in their absolute pomp were inflicted on them by Galway. So they, they tend not to have had that... that like, Kilkenny don't tend to have that effect... Um, on Galway and Galway just took them apart in Salt Hill. That's only four weeks ago, and uh, they only scored one two from play that day. So, um, like Galway are the biggest baddest team in town at the moment. They are the 
the art of Kilkenny of 10 years ago, you know, you know, physically they're huge. And that's why I thought the performances of Paddy Deegan in particular, with Joey Holden and Killen Buckley as well, like they, they weren't just winning high ball, they were winning high ball over men that were two or three inches taller than them. Yeah, is there an extent as well that Galway were reverting to the the one rare error and the one rare weakness they had last year, which was not scoring enough goals? And obviously last year they had enough points to go along with it, which they didn't have yesterday. Like they they outlined a couple of incidents in the Sunday game last night where they just weren't giving the final pass. They weren't playing the man on inside to get themselves into those goal scoring opportunities. Like, do you feel that, that could be a problem going forward, or do you feel it was just a one off yesterday once again? Yeah, well, I think last year was a really interesting year that way for, for um, teams like Galway winning the All-Ireland, not scoring a goal after the, whatever it was, the Leinster semi-final when they scored two against Dublin. That was a really interesting development because you know, we saw an awful lot in the league this year as well, teams playing with seven or eight defenders. Um, and I suppose the, the knock-on you know, tactical thing from that is that you know, teams have to take their points from 70, 80 yards out. And Galway are as good, if not better than that, at that than anybody else around. But like they did have kind of half chances if you want to call them um, where like Conor Whelan got through early on and, and, and could have squared the ball across uh, there was a couple of times I think it was Conor Cooney tried to double on the ball in the air and just basically took his eye off the ball or didn't make the proper connection when he could have maybe caught it and put it into the net but again like I don't want to harp on about it but it was a, it was a defender's day um, and some of the defenders a lot of the defenders performed an awful lot better than, than their direct markers which is fair going because in a lot of cases they were left kind of one-on-one -on -one in space with their men in Crow Park. Who do you think will learn more, Connor, from it yesterday? You know, Kilkenny, obviously, as you say, you know, had to probably match up physically to a certain degree, but will they, will they learn a bit more? Will they start to use the open spaces next week a bit more and try to keep it away from Burke and try to keep it away from that middle channel? Well, I was really surprised that they'd actually played TJ Reid centre forward and Walter Walsh at full forward. Now, they moved Walsh out to wing forward, I think, just to get under puck outs uh, for the last 15 minutes of the game. But, I mean, it was the real kind of Kerry hammer to hammer thing. You know, you put your two biggest guys on their two biggest guys and bank on winning whatever, 60% of the ball off that. I just wonder whether there'll be a bit more nuance to it next week, whether they'll mm. try and take advantage. Like, Colin Fenley only came on for the last couple of minutes yesterday and, like, a fellow with that sort of pace, you would have thought... Um, feeding off TJ Reid and uh, and Walter Walsh had to be winning a bit more clean possession. You know that definitely would have opened up a goal. But like, I actually think the manager who will learn more would be Brian Cody because he's so many young players in the team. Like Billy Ryan played yesterday, and I'm not sure did Billy Ryan even get a run in the league. He, he's kind of plucked straight from the under 21 team that beat Dublin last week in the Leinster semi final in Parnell Park. He scored two points yesterday, but he must have won five or six balls in front of his man. Um, and he had three wides and he, he looked like he had an awful lot of energy and he looked like he was kind of, you know, bold as brass. He wasn't perturbed by the occasion or, you know, the team that he was playing. Um, and like, it, it's, it's a strange thing to say, but over the last couple of years, Kenny have struggled to find two consistent, prolific corner forwards to play either side of, you know, Walter Walsh. Uh, Richie Hogan got on for the last couple of minutes yesterday as well. And I don't know physically what kind of shape he's in but he played two absolutely beautiful passes and um, one of which nearly set up the winner uh, for Walter Walsh and um, it was just slightly too high and by the time Walsh caught the ball and um, he was surrounded but you know if Richie Hogan can get on the pitch and, and they can get Colin Fenley back into the whole of the uh, whole of his health I actually think Kilkenny could go um, and win this game next Sunday um, you know I still think Galway are favourites for the All-Ireland but uh, I just think there's there's there'd be an awful lot of Kilkenny players that will be more certain about their roles in the team or their positions in the team. And I think Brian Cody will be an awful lot more um, happy with how his defence are performing against the best attack in the country. Uh, just since you brought up uh, Richie Hogan there, Connor, let's have a look at what Tommy Walsh was saying about him yesterday. At the same time, though, they still needed Richie Hogan to come in and help them out. I'd, I'd hazard and say that perhaps without the arrival of Richie Hogan, Galway would have won today. Would I be right there? Yeah, it, it's like, you see, the, the, the special players make things happen when they're not on. And we've seen it twice in the second half. The ball was in, he picked it up. So, you know, most players would try and go through the tackle and suddenly you're, you're bunched up again with the, with the physicality of that Galway backline. But no, Richie, he looked around. He didn't go for, 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 for the, to go past his players. Looked around. Suddenly, he was on the Cusack side of the field. Drove a ball 30, 40 yards across to the far side where Enda Morrissey was weighing, the half-back. And an easy point it looked, but 
look like. But that's why Galway have been doing so well because they make things look easy. That's what special players do. So I think Richie Hogan coming at, back in, doing what he has done, is going to give Kilkenny more belief. Lads, we have class. Look at what we can do as well. And I think it's setting Kilkenny up. I'd be thinking Galway will be the favourites. But I think with Richie Hogan back, it's going to give us the extra spark. And I think we'll have a chance. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point there, Connor, isn't it? Like He mentioned that in the Morrissey point and the crossfield ball for that. It was just unbelievable vision. And if Galway do manage to impose their physicality on Kilkenny next week, it does mean that running into the half-forward line is not going to be an option. It means that the big high ball into the full forward line is not going to be an option. It means that somebody like Richie Hogan and his crossfields uh, pucking at a ball could be absolutely vital to their chances next Sunday in Thurlis. Well, I think what was really noticeable about Richie Hogan's two passes was they actually stood out because there was so few of that kind of passing going on in the game. Mm. Um, like whoever was winning the ball was just looking up, looking into the looking into the forward line and picking which man they were going to give it to, whether that was into a pocket of space in front of a corner forward or just as it was. In a lot of cases, they just put the ball straight down on top of the full forward line. Whereas when Hogan came on, like all great players with great touch, when you get the ball into his hand, he, he, he always looked like he had an extra half a second. Uh, and he, he had the peripheral vision and the wrists to kind of pull off those passes in very tight spaces. So, um, yeah, like it, I, I, again, I don't know physically what sort of shape Richie Hogan's in. He's obviously worked very, very hard to get himself on the pitch. But that kind of creativity um, in, in that kind of really, really intense atmosphere, because like while the game didn't really catch fire, it was always very... It was always very intense. It was always very physical. Like it wasn't for a lack of energy. It, it was probably just the game just lacked maybe one really uh, sort of I don't know just one moment to, to light the thing on fire. I thought the the save that Owen Mur Murphy had early in the second half. If Galway had got a goal there, we could have been in for a much more kind of uh, end to end kind of game. But no, just on Richie Hogan. It, like if they can get him on the pitch for longer, um, he would be. He would be a massive addition uh, and he'd be a massive help to the rest of the Kilkenny forward line because uh, he, he is an incredible creative force when he gets on the ball. Yeah, just a, a final point then on this one ahead of Sunday, obviously because of uh, Michael Bublé in Croke Park. The game's been moved out of the province, so you've got a, a Connacht team against the Leinster team in a Munster ground. It's kind of gathered a little bit of controversy because of what happened with Waterford this year and the fact that they weren't allowed to play their home games in Nolan Park because it was outside the Munster jurisdiction. It does seem, though, on a separate case-by-case -case basis that Thurlis is the perfect venue for this replay on Sunday, given the circumstances. I think it is. I think it is. And, and neither manager was making any big deal about it yesterday. Um, Brian Cody had a bit of a laugh um, when we informed him who was playing at the concert. He wasn't uh, He wasn't particularly out fay with the works of Michael Bublé. Um, <laughs> but, um, That's a disgrace. No, like, like it is funny. And I think Colin Keyes made the point on off the ball. Um, I was listening to him going down to Newbridge on Saturday. But like, I think for the GA to host fixtures like they did in Newbridge the other night, um, and for, for that to be... You know, to, to give teams the, to, to be able to play home advantage in big games, a lot of grounds around the country are in need of an upgrade. And I think even at a local level, clubs are struggling nowadays to um, to facilitate the numbers of players that they have uh, at juvenile level just because they can't build pitches. Um, and like while the GA does get an awful lot of flack for being a money, you know, the money grabbing organisation are always financially geared when it comes to making their decisions. You know, like sooner or later, it has to be about money, you know. So if you tell Michael Bublé that he can't play a concert in Crow Park because, you know, they might need it for a Leinster final replay, like that's two million or whatever it is in revenue that the GA don't have that can't filter down to improve their facilities facilities at local level. So, you know, I think I think in this case, um, you know, we're not in the worst situation of all time, albeit the pitch in Torless didn't look didn't look like it was in great nick yesterday. They'll probably have to have some improvements of that during the week to, to host a decent Leinster final replay. No, yeah, you're, you're banging the money there. You can, act, you can actually see it on TV, really. You didn't need to be in the ground to see how bad uh, the surface was in Thurles. And I don't think the weather's going to change too much over the course of the next couple of days. Uh, we will focus, though, uh, for the time being, on what did happen uh, yesterday in Thurles between Clare and Cork. It was Clare 319, Cork 224. Uh, and I guess to use that, that old adage that you can always judge a team on how well they're coached and how well they're managed on how well they perform in the third quarter of the match and Cork hands down one in that section of the game and it is credit to, to John Myler who was harbouring a good bit of criticism earlier in the year Connor. Yeah it's a great win for Cork I mean two Munster titles in a row was not to be sniffed at in any era but um, you know particularly how they had to win it this year that that's like it's, it's incredible achievements. I have to say I left the house yesterday at half time to go to Crow Park 
Um, fully sure in the knowledge that Clare would be Munster champions by the time I arrived there. And then I arrived in Crow Park, press box with 10 minutes left to go. And not only had Cork seized the advantage, but Clare looked like they, they were... Clare looked they were all out of energy. Like they, mm. they looked like... I know they got a goal laid on to kind of put the put a bit of drama into it. But uh, Cork, when they turned the screw, when they made those changes, um, it looked like they completely seized the advantage. Like... It, but it, you know, early on, it just looked like John Connell was unplayable. He looked like he was going to have one of those days when you know he was going to define the, the Munster final. Um, and even early on, when Colin Spillane was shifted onto him, I think uh, Conlon did a fair bit of damage. But um, I, I, like again, like I don't know why Clare didn't move him. Um, like John Conlon has played centre forward in the championship already. Like he, he, you know, he he's he's a very prolific centre forward. But they just could not win a ball. Um, and I think it was the 63rd minute before Clare moved him from the full forward line where he was just getting absolutely starved the ball. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, all of Clare's all of Clare's passes were landing in that centre forward zone. It was landing towards Peter Duggan. Um, and Christopher Joyce was actually having a field day there, just winning ball and being able to distribute it at his leisure. So, yeah, there's a few things went into it. Like Cork obviously made the right changes, but I was just watching on the Sunday games. There's a couple of really poor lapses in concentration with regards to kind of marking. Um, from mm. a couple of players, Tony Kelly included. And when you're playing a team like Cork, a team that kind of keep possession the way they do um, and where their movement is, is so kind of orchestrated and, and, and predefined, you just can't switch off. Like, you just can't switch off. Um, and again, look, I have to say, Dara Fitzgibbon as well as a player for the last couple of years, I just thought was going to... Uh, I just think, think he's been a revelation. And when Cork put him at centre-forward, I actually think that was the... I think that was the the, the the most important switch in the entire game because yeah, his pace is just incredible and he's so he's so positive when he gets on the ball. He can just he just creates havoc back there. We were just saying, Connor, that one one before half time for Cork just seemed to put like a you know knife through Clare. We were kind of mentioning you know you can imagine the dressing rooms at half time. Clare obviously after playing a serious amount of hurling and, and only being four up, you know, whereas they could have been looking at eight or nine up, um, and it seemed to really rejuvenate Cork. And I, I I couldn't believe how flat Clare were in the second half. Yeah, and the the funny thing about the goal was, despite the fact that Clare were in the ascendancy, like if you look at it again, Seamus Harnady calls for a puck out. Now Harnady is obviously a very obvious target for a puck out, but like nobody tracked Luke Mays run. He ran twenty meters, and uh, nobody went with him. So, like you know, if if Clare are being very analytical about themselves and and they're being being very positive towards making something out of the summer. Um, there's very specific and easy areas for improvement. Like just you know, people have assigned men. Now there might be. There might be something more complex going on here, you know, like in certain situations, players don't mark other players when they go into a certain zone, you know, they have to park, pass men on, but it didn't look like that yesterday. Like it, the same, like um, Bill Cooper scored two points yesterday that he was completely unopposed. One came from a puck out and another, a long ball from Daniel Kearney. And, you know, I think, it, like, I don't want to take credit away from Cork because they were brilliant and they're, they're, they're worthy monster champions, but like Claire will... Claire will feel themselves that they only really have themselves to blame this morning. Yeah, um, we leave the hurling there for the time being, Connor. But before we let you go, we're just keen to get your take uh, on the Super Eights and as a result of uh, the the qualifier draw this morning for Round Four. You, you were in Newbridge, of course, uh, on Saturday night, and we've been speaking about that this morning. But the other kind of big movement that might occur, I guess, over the next week or two is uh, Declan Boner and his comments last week uh, on off the ball or on Saturday's off the ball about looking to move. Dublin versus Donegal to a different ground, to a neutral venue as such. Um, like what we're seeing from uh, from our viewers and our listeners at the moment is the, the old anti-Dublin bias uh, is what we, we've been, the stick that's been used to beat us with. Like I'm not sure if you agree with that, that this is just uh, usual anti-Dublin bias uh, from us here and off the ball or is there an actual case to be made here that this game should be moved for fairness sake to Clonus or to a different provincial ground? Well, there's definitely a cause to say that the game should not have been fixed for Crow Park in the first place. Um, like that was a decision that was taken at Congress when every county had delegates there in the GAA. Nobody actually thinks of what the resulting action is going to be until you're faced with the week of it. So, like, I think it's probably something they're going to have to look at in the future. But I would imagine that 
because Congress has decided. Like, those games aren't neutral venue fixtures, the Crow, Crow Park fixtures. I was just looking at the ruling the other day. Um, so, like, it would take something major for that game not to take place in Crow Park. And then you would have the Dublin game against the, their designated home game. Like, that's up to Dublin to, to nominate a venue as their nominated home venue. So, I would say that the likelihood at this stage is definitely that... Dublin are going. I'd say it would be ninety five percent certain that Dublin will play two of their Super Eight games in Cove Park. Whether that's fair, like you know, you could sit here and argue all, all morning, but like that's probably something that needs to be looked at before the start of next year. Because, I, like, in as much as I think everybody you know needs to be fair about venues and all the rest of these things, like we can't keep just changing the decisions the week before the games or two weeks before the games. Like these are decisions that are taken. Uh, by the delegates from all the counties that are involved, but like 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 a lot of things in GA democracy, they tend not to uh, they tend not to take, think of their actions until such time as they're actually faced with the reality. But I think that I think that's one of the main issues, Connor, is the fact that you know these decisions are taken, you know, months previous, and and you know the ramifications of them, uh, you know, either way, in a, in, a, in a positive or a negative way, aren't really thought through. And most people who go to you know the Congress situation, you know, okay, I'm sure lots of people you know delve through and actually read these, you know, the various different things 100. percent But there's plenty who just go and you know if it's a yay or a nay, they just kind of go with the crowd. And and unfortunately, what happens is you get situations like this, and there's then piecemeal stuff done and you know stuff is thrown out and you know it's something that really needs to be thought through um, and as you say needs to be fixed before next year because it is an unfair situation um, and it will only continue. Yeah I think so but the, the other way of looking at it too is and I don't want to sort of like I don't want to hang on like on the side of Dublin should play the game at Crow Park like you know I, I, like I think that Dublin versus Cork or Tyrone game um, either in Parky Cave or Oma, it's just going to be incredible. Like that's going to be yeah. one of the highlights of the summer. But like when you envisage Dublin playing a big away game in the championship, like Healy Park was one of the one of the places. Healy Park or Castle Bar were the two places where I thought, now that would be that would be some atmosphere. So that's going to be an incredible one. And if you had two of them, absolutely, I think it would add to the summer. But I think Crow Park are in a situation now where, say, the four All Ireland quarter finals no longer exist, and they were fixed for Crow Park in previous years. Um, so now we're talking about taking one of the two Super 8 games out of Crow Park. Um, so like we're getting to a situation where nobody really wants to play in Crow Park anymore. So they're trying to figure out, like, what, other than Michael Bublé concerts, what exactly are we using the stadium for? So, like, I, like I think for, for Crow Park to take that game out of Crow Park or for the CCC or for some arm of the GAA to take one of those games out of Crow Park, they would have to take the more... The less lucrative and and the option with the most hassle, and I'd say that's probably unlikely at this point. Mm. Yeah, I think we can probably agree with you on that front, anyway, Connor. Uh, Connor, thank you very much uh, for taking the call this morning. Enjoy, Good, enjoy Michael Bublé next week. <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs>